and giving you a brief overview of some of the challenges we had during development of this vehicle. The CX-3 is our smallest sky active uh, platform that utilizes the all-wheel drive, front-wheel drive platform. And it encompasses all the sky active technologies, the sky active body, the engine, the transmission, and the chassis. Sky active technologies was introduced in 2012 with two main philosophies. The first one being clean sheet engineering from fundamental principles. Two, making all parts of the vehicle work together as an efficient whole. Basically, we started over. Complete uh, sheet, clean sheet, no legacy parts coming in, and uh, basically complete, uh, making a whole new vehicle, or a whole new group of technologies, sorry. <clears throat> so, pardon me. So the result of this is that we have a vehicle that has low impact in the environment because it's using less fuel economy, and it's creating less pollutants, but still delivering on the Mazda dynamic. It's still very fun. And we want to make sure that the CX-3 delivered the same type of dynamic that its bigger siblings did, that it's substantial, that it's confident, and stable. Okay, so the SkyX technologies were introduced in the uh, CX-5, the Mazda 6, the Mazda 3. So again, I've talked about how do we get all these technologies into a smaller vehicle? So that's the challenge for us. So it starts with the body. The body is all new, and the body has three key, uh, has three key roles. First, it has to be safe. It has to limit the amount of intrusions in, in the event that you have an impact. Two, it has to be efficient, but still be able to dampen out any type of road noises or unwanted noises into the cabin. And three, it has to be rigid. It has to allow the chassis to do its job so that we can deliver on our promise to the drivers that it's fun. <clears throat> okay, safety first. So the Skyactiv uh, body, there's three main philosophies. First, it's the ring structure. The ring structure is key because basically what we're doing is creating a roll cage around the body. Next is the straight frame construction. This basically takes an impact and disperses it throughout the whole body. Next is the multi-load path. Basically what that does is it takes the load and distributes it amongst the key members so that you can limit that intrusion into the cabin space. So what's changed? Well, you'll notice here there's kind of a hole. So normally if this was uh, continuous, it would go all the way through. And in, the, in this case, we have a hole because of packaging needs. And what we might do, have done in the past, because of legacy parts, we might have actually had to add reinforcements here. This would have made it more uh, made it, uh, heavier chassis. So what we ended up doing in an effort to keep it lightweight is we actually changed the material so that uh, we could put, uh, I'm sorry, we removed some of the uh, chassis uh, rails here. We actually removed this piece here and changed this material and changed the floor material to make it lighter and still make it very efficient in the event of a crash. And how did we do that? Well, you can still see here, it looks like there's a rail, but what we did is we stamped the rail into the floor. So you had the floor was like this, and we stamped it in, and then we took the main rail, and we capped it off, and then what that does, or, and then we flared it at the end. And so in the event of a crash, when the load comes in, it actually goes down into this cap and flares out into the rest of the body. So that's how we're able to maintain <clears throat> the safety in the, uh, this area of the vehicle. Okay, what I, this little plat palette here is our, what I call the modulus menu. What this shows here is how much effort and time we spent in looking at every key element of the body. We wanted to make sure there were, that each piece was doing and contributing something to what the vehicle had to do, so there's no excess waste. And in the end, the body ended up being comprised of about 63% of high tensile steels and a lot of ultra high tensile steels. Because the guys did such a great job of making the body uh, um, rigid and very safe, we were actually able to put materials back into the car so we could actually dampen out some of the road noises. So what you see here in these green areas is actually material that we put in, made it a little thicker so it could dampen out the noises. And then we were also able to add more insulation into the vehicle that you would normally not find in a vehicle of this segment. And again, that is just to give the uh, a nice um, substantial feeling and quality into this vehicle. And the next is to move on to make sure that the chassis was nice and rigid. So if you don't have a nice rigid chassis, what's going to happen 
is that your chassis components are going to be working against the floor, right? You're not going to get that preciseness that you feel in our vehicles. So when the guys analyze the, the body specifically for chassis, we realized that we only added a few key reinforcements. We added one at the front of the vehicle, one across the rear, and across the, uh, where the upper strut mounts are. And then you just have to optimize the sheet metal to make sure that the hatch area was nice and stiff. And that's it. So now kind of going into the chassis components. The Skyactiv chassis is really well known for being lightweight, for having great feedback in the steering, and also in how the chassis moves. It also has very good, excellent ride quality. And we'll go into a little more detail as I go into the specific parts later. So again, the challenge is how do we get these components into a smaller vehicle? We wanted to make sure we protected the layout. As Ken has pointed out, it's very important to the driver and its occupants. And more specifically, we wanted to make sure we had cargo space. So the major change was to the rear suspension. When we launched the Skyactiv Technologies, we had a multi-link rear suspension. As you can see, that's a quite big piece of architecture there. You've got a subframe, you've got the arms, the dampers, and springs, and they're all incorporated in one piece. And what we were able to do was actually use a torsion beam rear suspension. This suspension's got great balance for rigidity and being lightweight. And we spent a lot of time tuning it to make sure that the car um, delivers on the driving dynamic. And keeping in uh, alignment with our Skyactiv philosophies, we still use, utilize a high pivot point, and this is very important for the ride, because what happens with a high pivot point, when it's up like this, when you, a rear wheel hits a bump, it takes a more natural trajectory, so the rear suspension can move, and now we can control the suspension movement really precisely with the damper. If the pivot point was level like this, what ends up happening is the wheel, or the the bump hits the wheel, the wheel actually kind of grabs the bump because you have to compress the tire, and that actually disrupts the, uh, the pivot up front and adds um, a vibration into the ride. So we can actually isolate much better with a higher pivot point. So this gives you guys an idea of how much uh, space is uh, saved by going with the torsion beam. So using this reference point of the mounting of the high pivot point, can see how much space we were able to save. Okay, going up to the front of the car, basically nothing's really changed up here. It's a little more compact. It's a uh, McPherson uh, style front stu uh, strut assembly. And we're still using uh, electric power steering here. <clears throat> and we're still incorporating the uh, high caster angle. So we're able to deliver with that electric power steering here, <coughs> caster angle, very stable. Uh, uh, front suspension that gives great feedback. So what you guys will recognize when you drive this car, and we've talked about this before, it actually started way back with Mazda 5 um, as part of our Jimba Tai philosophy around dynamics. And come see me at lunchtime, and I'll give you a little more input about that. But our dynamic is such that when you start to steer the car in, as the car starts to roll, it gives you feedback to understand what it's about to do. And the, the roll motion is a little bit that it likes to squat, and then it gets really nice and linear as you start to steer the car, and you can really feel that preciseness, and you'll be able to feel that out on these roads today. And this is also very good for your passenger, because then your passenger will start to realize that the car is moving, and they're starting to notice a slight roll and yaw motion, so they can brace for whatever's happening and not be surprised. And the type of input, whether it's a really quick input or a very nice, slow, precise input, you're going to get really good feedback to understand what the car's doing. Okay, sticking with the front end of the car, we've got the two liter uh, Skyactiv engine. This is well known again for its great efficiency, and at the same time, it's got great torque. It comes in at 2,800 RPMs with 100 foot, 146 pounds of torque. So again, how do we get this motor into a smaller package? With the CX-5, we had this H point here up nice and high, far away from the front wheel well. You go down to the Mazda 3, it gets low, and then we pick it up to the <coughs> CX-3. And you'll notice now that the uh, driver's uh, feet are really close to the front of the car. So we want to make sure we want to protect this footwell space. This is really important for the driver. They need to feel like they have space to operate the pedals. And we also want to make sure we protect those feet. So 
What do we have to change? Well, we had to make a big change to this very important part of the engine, which is our four to two to one header. This header is really important because what it does is it pulls the heat out of the, end, uh, out of the, um, out of the combustion chamber. And we want to make sure that we're able to control that really well so we can get an efficient burn. We don't want to have any pre-ignition going on. Um, as you can see earlier, I talked about that we have a really high compression ratio. So we want to make sure that that area in the compression chamber is really well controlled. And this is a key element to the pulling that heat out. So we couldn't just change it in any particular way. We actually still need to make those runners nice and long. And the guys were able to figure out how to actually still keep a nice long runner, but still um, be a positive effect of the engine that we still get our great torque that we're looking for and still maintain a high efficient catalytic converter. The next major change was in the transmission area. Now our Sky Active transmission is really well known for being direct and having a manual-like feel. It's very responsive and at the same time it's highly efficient. So the major change in the transmission was that we actually made it more compact. We changed the final drive gear ratio here, and this pulled out about 27 millimeters out of the transmission. And then we had the distance between the engine and the drive shaft uh, uh, a little more changed to 10 millimeters, or a little closer by 10 millimeters. By doing this, we actually made the transmission even a little more efficient and a little lighter. We're still using the mechatronic module in the system. This is very well uh, known for being very precise because as the engine gets, or as the transmission gets a little older, it actually can self-adjust, so it keeps that nice, direct, precise feeling in the transmission. Okay, we also offer manual mode in this transmission. Um, the manual mode is really responsive. It feels uh, very direct, as I mentioned before in the transmission. But what's really nice is that we have rev match downshifting. So as you're breaking into a corner, the transmission will actually rev match and so you'll get a nice smooth transition, so you're not gonna have a sudden lurch of uh, you know, weight transfer, so you can keep the car really stable and enter into the corners really nicely. We also offer uh, sport mode, and sport mode's good for two things. When you're on a winding road, what the sport mode does is it actually holds the gear in the sweet spot of the torque range. So as you enter into the corner, you can get onto the binders, steer the car in, come out right in the sweet spot of the torque range, and pull under the throttle, and the car will pull really nicely and it'll hold that gear to up to the next corner. So the car can kind of recognize whether you're going downhill or uphill. If it does have to shift, it'll do it really quickly, and then it'll, when you get on the binders, it'll run match, downshift, so you'll always have really nice control. And the second point is for the freeway. So when you're merging up onto the freeway, normally what would happen if you didn't have sport mode, is you get up onto the freeway, right, and you need to fill the hole, and then if you happen to lift off the throttle a little bit, the car might upshift, right, because it thinks you want to start the, um, you know, cruising. But if you want to get out of that hole and into more open space in sport mode, it'll stay in that sweet spot in the torque range. You can dump into the throttle and the car will respond. So in sport mode, we actually have the engine so it responds just a little quicker than it does in its normal mode. And when you're keeping a, when you get up onto the freeway, you do want to make sure you want to pull it off the sport mode because it will deteriorate your fuel economy. So now talking about fuel economy, the front wheel drive gets 35 miles to the gallon in the, uh, on the highway, 29 miles per gallon in the city. It's basically the class leader we feel here amongst this group. We've got the HRV, the Juke, the Mini uh, Countryman Cooper, and the Soul. And when you look at the all wheel drive, we're basically among leaders here. Again, the HRV, the Juke, and the Countryman for all wheel drive vehicle comparisons. <coughs> 